let's first bring up some some code here here we see the the main um, the main data structure of this data stream subsystem and let me also bring up something where I can draw what is this all about um, every Every code that, that deals with something like image decoding or PDF decoding, PDF parsing, will need some kind of a data stream abstraction. And for reasons that I will briefly discuss uh, in a minute, the first question is what, what do we mean with, with a data stream? And that's really simple. In our case, so um, a data stream is simply a sequence of bytes. And we can think of it in this way. So um, it's like a long river of bytes. We don't know how long it is. It, can potentially be very long, so it could be gigabytes of data. So each of these boxes is a byte. And the data stream is simply the sequence of all of these bytes. And now the important thing is that you might ask, okay, so what's the difference between simply an array? Because that looks very much like, like what an array is, right? And it's actually almost the same the difference is that um, for an array, you can make the assumption that the complete array is in your address space at the same time. And you know where it begins and where it ends in your address space. That's the, that's the only real significant difference between an array of bytes and a data stream in our case. So we are not talking about complicated things like object streams and, and, and so on. So I think the, these, these notions like object, object streams and so on, they do not, um, they wouldn't be good for, for our code base. So we really want very simple um, streams of bytes and we do not want to over complicate things and as these sequences of bytes are something very simple we also expect that the data stream subsystem should be should be appropriately simple so let's draw to compare this let's draw an array of bytes looks very similar. Uh, the big difference is, as I said, it's you know that it, the, the whole array is in your address space and often also in your working set uh, at the same time. So I mean you can do smart things with virtual memory that part of the array is actually swapped out but even if it is, it's just completely in your address space and you can just dereference pointers into any part of the array. Uh, with, with the stream it's different because with the stream uh, we assume that it can potentially be very large and it can also be of unknown length. So that is, that is important. So that's one of the big differences between a simple array and the stream that for the stream we do not necessarily know at which byte it ends. How about the beginning? Do we know where the data stream starts? That's already um, one of the first design decisions that you need to make. Do you have a known beginning of the stream? And actually, I decided that in my code base, I will assume that the stream has a definite beginning. So somewhere we will assume that somewhere there is byte zero. 
there's byte or offset, let's say offset zero. And you may ask, does this assumption actually restrict what we can do? And I think the answer is, as long as you are parsing only in the forward direction, you do not lose anything by, you don't lose any, any freedom by assuming that there is a definite byte zero. So this is also something we need to talk about, the two directions that you can have. So we have the forward direction that is in the direction of increasing address. And you have the backward direction. And that is also one of the design decisions to make. Do you need backward parsing or not? And unfortunately for PDF, the answer is yes. Yes, you need some backward parsing because of the strange uh, file organization of PDFs where you have to find some structures from the end of the file um, because their locations are not known when you pass from the beginning. So we, yes, we need some backward parsing, unfortunately. However, the backward parsing is only used rarely and does not need to be very performant. So I will put it in parentheses. We do need it, but it's, it's, not, it's not performance critical. So it would be okay if it would be slower. And um, as, we, as we do backwards parsing, it is uh, of some relevance whether we um, assume that there is a byte zero because this excludes uh, the, the bytes beyond this starting byte. We cannot have an open-ended stream in the backward direction. But this is okay because we actually only need the backwards feature for finding structures at the end of uh, PDF files and file streams always have a definite beginning. So for file streams, this is okay. A file stream has a well-defined first byte. And for everything else, so for the forward passing, we can always assume that we have this, uh, this uh, beginning because we can never hit the beginning by passing forward from somewhere else. So it's no problem. Um, the next big question is, if you start to de design uh, your data stream and subsystem, so, so one, one question is, what assumptions can I make about these streams? Um, and we will make only the assumption that there are sequences of bytes and that they have a well-defined beginning. They might not have a predefined end, so we might actually only find out about the end when we hit it. Uh, this is important because in some cases, so for files we actually could find out the end, but um, we will have cases of substreams where it's difficult or might be difficult to find out uh, the end beforehand. In some cases it's actually not difficult and we want to have a very defined end, but in general we will not assume that we can predict where the end of the stream will be. What other assumptions can we make? Um, well, the next big question is actually, the, and, and um, I think we cannot answer more questions about the assumptions before we clarify another thing about uh, what we actually want to do with the streams. And that is the question, uh, do we want to, to read? Uh, or, um, should not write it's horribly. Do we want to write to the streams or both? 
And my thinking about this is that these three cases are really very, very different. So a stream library that supports both writing and reading, so reading from and writing to the same stream is a very different beast than something that uh, supports only reading or only writing. There are a lot of issues that only come up if you support both reading and writing on the same stream. And as we do not need that for uh, the, the PDF parsing and also not for the image parsing or decoding. So we, we will ex exclude this possibility. So definitely not both. And actually reading and writing are also very different. They are kind of mirror images of each other, but not really. So uh, I think it's much cleaner to, to deal with them separately. So we, are, we will also not deal with writing. We will only deal with reading, which makes the problem quite simple. And so we will be only dealing with reading and mostly in the forward direction and some support for backwards reading. Um, with reading, we need to think about, uh, the next thing we need to think about is, do we support random access or only sequential access? So the, the two typical patterns that you will have is sequential access in, for example, in increasing address order or maybe also with backwards in decreasing address order. And the other case is random access. And here, um, it gets already a bit more difficult. So mostly I think we will need to support random access because you need it, for example, in PDF files, because not all PDF files are organized in such a way that you can uh, sequentially read them easily. There, are, there is a subset of PDF files that is, I think it's called linearized in PDF language that are so those are files that are optimized for sequential reading but not all of the pdf files that you find are, are written in this way and so in general we need we need random access into the data streams and and this will be implemented by supporting seek as a primitive so we will support a seek operation that puts the, the file or stream pointer to a specified offset from the beginning. <clears throat> so let me see in my notes if we have discussed them. Um, we still have not dis discussed why you need abstractions for data streams at all. Uh, so this will be one of the next points. So, yeah. And I think this um, restricting everything to reading only will make our abstraction very clean. I had recently the opportunity because one thing I did off stream is that I um, incorporated um, open JPEG for decoding JPEG 2000 images. Uh, I actually already have some, some code working that uh, extracts some JPEG 2000 images from PDFs and uses open JPEG and some other decoder for, for decoding them. And open JPEG also like practically all libraries to deal with image decoding has a stream subsystem a stream, a data stream abstraction, and they choose to go a different way. They have read and write in the same abstraction, and I don't find it very clean. 
also they made some other choices that I do not agree with um, that we will maybe talk about later. Uh, yeah, so in general, what is important to, to me in, in my data stream uh, code is that I want it to be very, um, very fast, so it should be efficient. And it should, it should have as little overhead as possible over simply using an array, because actually um, in many cases, it will be a good choice to put a complete file into memory because computers nowadays have so large um, that the, the RAM that you that you have is available is, is so large that for small and medium files it's just usually a good choice to just put the whole file into memory and then you can simply access it as an array in your address space. And in this case, we also, for, for simplicity in the code, we also want to use the data stream uh, subsystem, the data stream abstraction for that, but it should add as little overhead as possible over just using a simple array, which is of course the fastest possibility. So that's important, but also it should work well if you, if you want to get down memory requirements and if we um, only decide to only buffer a smaller part, usually a few kilobytes. If you only buffer a few kilobytes of the stream at a time, it should also work well. The extreme case would be if you have a stream buffer of only a single byte. That is not realistic for image decoding, but you could have such a thing if you're dealing, for example, with serial interfaces. Um, if you have a UART interface that uh, sends and receives single bytes, you can, could really have this extreme case where you have a buffer of a single byte, but that will not be an important case for us. It should, should work if it doesn't make the, the rest of the code more difficult, but it's not what we are aiming at. So we are aiming at, um, I should write it somewhere. <clears throat> we are aiming at buffers of Uh, of a few kilobytes uh, to few kilobytes to complete file buffer. Okay, uh, there I made made myself some other notes what is important. I don't know in which sequence to discuss this. Um, maybe, maybe now we should one point we should definitely discuss is why do you need a data stream abstraction at all? Couldn't you just um, code yourself, uh, code, make your code very concrete, uh, writing file accesses, for example, directly into your code? And the answer is that is not feasible, for example, if you if you do PDF parsing because of some features of the PDF file format. And for this you need to know roughly how, how a PDF file works. So PDF is a kind of an object-oriented format. It is quite similar in spirit to something like JSON, uh, or bait with, um, with enhancements for large binary objects. But in principle, a PDF file is a, um, a sequence of objects and these objects can be things like arrays and dictionaries and also primitive types like strings and, and numbers. 
And the aggregate, aggregate types like arrays and dictionaries can contain, recursively contain other objects like again arrays and dictionaries and um, to an arbitrary depth basically. And also um, you can have large binary objects called streams. And so, so the whole file is, is this sequence of these, of these objects. Object one, object two, object three. Some of them can be very small. So an object could be just, uh, just a stream, uh, a string, sorry, a string like foo with a few characters. It could be a, a, a number, either integer or floating point, but both are supported by PDF. And then you can have very, very large objects that are streams. And these streams are how most of the content of the PDF file is actually uh, stored. So both the page content and also so-called external objects like images are stored as streams in PDF files. And the important thing about streams is that they support filters, which is the PDF term for transformations that are done on the data in order to, for example, compress it or also encrypt it. So the stream is a blob of binary data in, so, so actually it has a, a header with some meta information about the stream, which is stored in the dictionary. So the stream starts with a, a dictionary ob object. Dict dictionary that contains some meta information like the length of the stream data and also which filters are used. And then you have the actual binary data that makes up the rest of the stream object. And this, so this is just a blob of, of binary data. And this can go to an, uh, an arbitrary chain of, of filters. So these filters are specified in the stream dictionary. Yeah, and they can be changed. So, so you can have any number of these filters. And at the end of the filter chain, you get out your uncompressed data that you actually use, use to render something. So, and these filters can be all kinds of stuff. For example, they can be the uh, Zlib flate decoding that is used a lot in PDFs, for example, for the page content streams and so on. So this can be a deflate algorithm, for example. So let's say this is deflate algorithm of, of Zlib. And it can also be something complicated like JBIG too. So, So the JBIG2 decoder is in PDF terms implemented as a filter that you can apply to these uh, streams in, in, and you can apply, actually you can apply it to anything, not, not just to images. And that's a, a funny thing in PDF files. And this is also used, for example, by attackers to hide their exploits. So uh, there have been um, so people have found malicious code in PDF files in all kinds of um, disguises. 
And one way to disguise it, so that, so that the malicious code is often something like a snippet of JavaScript because Adobe had this completely crazy idea that you want to have JavaScript uh, snippets supported in documents, which is, I mean, it's just insanity. And these JavaScript um, snippets, they can call functions in your PDF viewer. And this is, of course, a huge invitation to uh, malicious code. And so attackers have written uh, malicious code, JavaScript code that exploits bugs in Adobe Acrobat Reader, for example. And one way to hide this JavaScript is to put it into, um, into compressed data. So you could put your JavaScript, for example, here and run it to, through some filters in order to compress it and put the compressed data into, into the PDF. And if you choose a very complicated encoding like JBIG2, which is normally for black and white images, but can be used also for encoding arbitrary binary data in principle, uh, then you make it very hard for analysis tools to detect your JavaScript because the analysis tool really needs to implement the whole JBIG2 uh, standards in order to even see that uh, what you are putting there is, is JavaScript code, for example. But the actual point I want to make is why do you need um, a, a stream abstraction? Because you need to do some complicated stuff with this data that comes out here. For example, you need to render this. So this uh, could be content that goes into your rendering pipeline. And the problem is now, um, if you do not have a data stream abstraction, you would need to code your, your rendering pipeline for every possible combination of filters that could be between you and the data in the PDF file. Because if you write, if, if you put direct file reading, read, file reading calls into your rendering pipeline, it would only work in the case that you have no filters at all, because it would directly um, access the uncompressed data in the file. If, if there is a setlib filter, you would need to, to write uh, calls to setlib into your rendering pipeline to go through, so to, to get the, the deflated data back. And, and so on for every combination of filters. So you would have to have one version that calls the JBIG2 decoder and this JBIG2 decoder then uh, could again need to call setlib deflate if it is uh, a filter that is put behind the setlib deflate uh, or it could need to call directly uh, to file reading if there's no deflate filter afterwards and so on. And so you have a combinatorial explosion of code uh, that you need to handle PDF files. And that's why you definitely, if, <clears throat> in order to make the, the, the problem tractable, you need an abstract interface between these filters. So you do not need to implement this combinatoric explosion of stuff. <clears throat> so what you, what you actually need is you don't, uh, in, you don't uh, implement these uh, data flows directly, but what you implement is only you implement uh, against an interface of, so you have here a, a data stream abstraction. And your rendering pipeline just says, says for example, okay, give me the next a kilobyte of, of data, whatever it is. And so this is what is implemented by, by this filter. It implements this data stream abstraction and the filter itself again gets its input data from such a data stream abstraction.
and does not care about what other filters might be needed to provide its input data. And here you have another such as abstraction, finally providing the access to the actual data in the file. So this goes, this only needs to know about this, and this is implemented by this. This only needs to know about this. And so the filter is simply a bridge between two data stream abstractions. And in the end, the, the rendering and whatever comes afterwards also only needs to, to know how to uh, access the data stream abstraction. Okay, this is implemented here. Okay, so uh, that's why you need it. In order to factor your, the whole huge problem of decoding PDFs into some uh, manageable pieces. And I think there's really no, no way around that. And so that's why all of also, all image decoders um, have something like that because they never know where the, where the data that they need to decode is coming from. Is it coming from a file? Is it coming from a network socket, for example? You just don't know. Is it coming directly from memory? Is it embedded in, in a container file structure or, or something like that? So, in order to, to not care about that, you need the abstraction. <clears throat> so, um, I have already the uh, data stream subsystem working in my code and I want to quickly explain how it, how it works currently. The stream is this abstract sequence of bytes. And in, in order to get any reason, reasonable speed, uh, you make the assumption that at least a part of this data is buffered in an array in memory. So corresponding to a part of the stream, you have a, an array called a stream buffer in, in memory. And as long as you move within this buffered window, you can actually treat the data just like any other array in memory. <clears throat> it works like this, that you have a, a pointer to the beginning of the buffer. You have a pointer to the end of the buffer. And you have a running pointer to the current location in the stream where you are at. And if you look at the actual code, that is exa exactly what you see here. So a data stream is just a data structure that contains these pointers. Those are the most important elements of the, there are also other ones that we will need later, but this is the <coughs> really the most important part of the interface. And the contract with the user code is that as long as you keep, um, as long as you keep the pointer, the running pointer, between buff and end, you can do whatever you want. So you can move the pointer, pointer around. So that's, that's important that, and let's write this in red because, so this pointer is read and write, is allowed to be read and written by the user code. So the user code can uh, dereference this pointer to get the next byte and it can also increment the pointer. It can also decrement the pointer if it wants it, as long as it does not go beyond buff and end. So buff and end on the other hand they are read only for the user code. So the user code is not allowed to change the buff pointer or the end pointer. <clears throat> And this, um, this makes the overhead very small because the user code can almost 
handle the, the stream buffer if it, if, as if it was a simple array. The only thing is it needs to check for, for hitting the end or the beginning of the buffer because the data could actually continue past the end, but it's simply not buffered in memory currently. So it, there need to be special cases in the code for when you hit the end pointer, then you need to request from the stream. Uh, you need to tell the stream, hey, I hit the end pointer. <clears throat> Can you give me some more data? And this is what I call uh, fetch in, in my framework. So whenever the code hits the end, it can um, issue a, a fetch. So how, how should we draw this here? And let's draw it like this. So if it hits the end, it can um, hand over control to the stream, telling it to fetch data. And what it will uh, get back again, what it will get back is a new buffer. And the important thing is that the contract between the user code, so let's say here we have, here we have the user code, the code using the, the stream abstraction, um, and here we have the stream implementation. The stream implementation is a layer between the buffer and the actual uh, stream itself. And we should actually, I should, I should draw this differently. So I should, I should, oh, the problem is always when I erase, you see the layer Do not know GIMP good enough to to erase actually to the background color. So let's just use a white brush. Let's just use a white brush here. Okay, so the tool change did not really did not really work with my graphic tablet. So um, the point I wanted to make is that the stream implementation is a layer uh, in between the, the buffer that is visible to the user code and the stream that is invisible to the user code. So So this part is uh, visible to user code. And this part up here is invisible to user code. And that's an important distinction. And if the user code wants more data, it, it can only go to this abstraction and tell it to fetch. And what it gets back is a new pair or triple of buff, pointer, and end. And so th these can be modified. <clears throat> and the important thing is that the fetch invalidates all of these pointers. So the user code is not allowed to assume for example, that the new buffer will be in the same reach in memory. It might be, it often will be, but the user code is not allowed to assume that. Uh, as we also need to do backwards parsing, we will actually also need to have something like a fetch backwards. Uh, 
that does the same thing uh, in the other direction that <clears throat> returns a new triple buff pointer end that, that um, corresponds to data that is earlier in the stream. So this is the understanding that um, there's a correspondence between this buffer and a certain part of the stream and with fetch I, I get the next, the next piece of data but I don't re actually really know because um, where this comes from because this is invisible to the user code. Okay, so that is the first important um, idea here. And this is actually already not the same in all, all kinds of stream libraries. So you have also libraries where the, the contract with the user code is that the user code, for example, does not even directly see the stream buffer. It must call methods on the stream buffer or data member, um, sorry, member functions of the stream buffer in order to get data and so on. And this we don't do. So we actually allow the user code to directly uh, grab this pointer and do whatever it likes. This is, of course, advantages and disadvantages, but I think it just uh, makes for much more efficient uh, user code that we do not need to always, we do not always need to call um, call some abstract interface. Uh, in order to, to get uh, data here. Also, it means that uh, this organization is actually fixed. This is always done like this, which means that we can also implement a lot of um, non-virtual um, helper functions that do useful stuff like, for example, uh, get the next, get a, a big endian 32-bit integer from the stream this can be implemented once and for all using this interface and it does not need to be a virtual function, it just can be a um, non-virtual uh, statically known uh, function that, that does stuff like this. Only the, the fetching uh, needs to be the fetching needs to be implemented by something like virtual functions or actually it will be implemented by just plain function pointers because the fetching depends on the implementation that is behind how this data is actually provided. Uh, one downside is that fetch really in my design has no um, parameters. So the user code cannot tell how many bytes it wants to see. Uh, the, the implementation is free to decide how many bytes to provide. The only contract is it must provide at least one byte if possible. So that's in the contract. This uh, provides um, at least one byte except at end of stream. <clears throat> and for this, here we can also then decide how do we handle this? How do we actually recognize that we got back this end of, of stream or end of file condition? We could recognize it just by if we get back a buff and the end pointer that are equal, it means we have zero bytes in the buffer that we could that could be our hint that we reached end of file. I'm not sure. I mean currently I have an end of file data member. I'm no longer sure that that is the best idea. So this is this is a design decision about which I'm not not sure because 
as you will see later, this end of file can be a difficult thing because when you have random access, you can actually move back. Once you have hit the end of file, you can move back into um, the, the middle of the stream and then this end of file condition goes away. And this is um, something where I'm not, not yet completely sure how to, how to handle this in the nicest possible way. So that's actually something we need to decide. Do we want to have a... So currently I have an end of file boolean uh, one problem here is the backwards parsing. So for the backwards parsing, do we actually also use this for the other case for hitting the beginning? Or do we have a separate marker for beginning of file? So that I'm unsure about. In any case, both of these markers would be read-only for, for user code. Yeah, another important thing is um, a very important requirement for the data stream subsystem is that it can generate nice error messages. That, that tell the user about the context in the stream, that the position and the position and the context in the stream where something invalid happened or was encountered. So um, I can show you an example. Um, let's just let's parse let's parse one of the invalid uh, reference files. So for example, let's not skip, let's not skip the file 13 here. And let's see what, what kind of error we get. may take quite a while until we reach the, the error. So let me just write down the questions we come across. So the first question we came across is, um, do we want explicit end of file beginning of file uh, data members. That's one question. The second question is if, if yes is the answer to the first one, um, do we use separate ones for beginning and end of file? This makes it more attractive to say no to the first part because then we don't need to answer this question. Okay, so those are two. Yeah, so we got the, the error message here and so let's let's look at the at the error message. Uh, let me make the, the chat window smaller because unfortunately nobody wants to chat anyway. So I don't know if anybody is watching at all. Officially, somebody is watching. So please tell me what's up if you want to, or if you have any questions or, or suggestions. Um, so this would be an example of a nice error, hopefully nice error message. So it says that reading, this is already a stream context thing. Uh, 
because the actual parser does not know that it is reading a file. This is hidden behind the data stream abstraction. But the parser can tell uh, the stream abstraction, hey, there was a problem. I need to tell the user where the problem was. And the stream abstraction provides a function for that. Um, that's called fail context, I think, in my case. And it formats a nice context message like this. So it says, okay, we were reading file such and such. Uh, then we can have nested, nested contexts because we were actually in a limited substream. So substreams is something we still need to talk about, but there can be nested streams within streams. In this case, we were in a limited substream, substream that is about 30K bytes long. We also get uh, that we were at relative position such and such in the substream. Um, the, we get the length of the substream. So, okay, this is not the length of the substream. This is how many bytes it has left. This is a bit, this is a bit confusing that this is, so let's make a note about this, um, about the error reporting. So we want to uh, report errors in nested substreams in a less confusing way. That's actually not, not such an easy problem how to report errors in these nested substreams. But at least we have the information there. We see that the substream starts at a certain pipe in the file and how far it extends and so on. So a lot of information here for debugging and um, now we actually have the, the funny situation that we have inside this substream, we have another substream that is again limited. So that's, yeah, that, that is a bit confusing. We want to do better here. And then we have the actual error report at position so-and-so. Uh, it prints a context of the position. So we, and it actually already has the feature that it can guess whether it is in a text portion or in a binary portion. You can either tell it explicitly or it can guess automatically by looking at the bytes, how many of these bytes are printable as seed characters. And it decides whether to print a hex dump or uh, print a text, um, print it in ASCII text with some escape characters and so on. And you see the, the current location marked. And you can look at some bytes uh, here and it tells you what was wrong. So invalid refinement delta values. That's, that's actually what the parser says. So all the things before are, pre are provided by the stream implementation. The parser just says, hey, I have this invalid refinement delta value at the current location please describe to the user what is the current location and its context. This is a very, very important um, requirement for the stream subsystem that it is able to provide nice and readable context information. And here actually we, we already run into some interesting design problems. Because, let's bring back up this picture again. Um, an interesting question is, what if the parser, so let me, uh, let me add here a layer for drawing. Um, what if the parser finds an error here at the end of the stream buffer. What context do we report? It is easy to, to report this part of the context that goes before because we have it, pub have it buffered. However, it, it might be very interesting for the user to also see some, some context after this. So, uh, Actually, the error is here in the last byte. 
And the question is, is there, can we also report some context here that has not yet been read from the stream? The user code cannot do it because the user code only sees this part and now it ran into an error and it needs to do its own exit strategy and, and um, but it could ask the, the stream implementation to provide some more context. So this is also a design question. I'm not sure about how to answer this. Should we make the effort in the stream implementation to, to fetch more context for just for error reporting if it is not already buffered? The problem is, the problem is that in order to do this, we might either need to allocate some memory because we, we also need the buffered part to report the previous bytes. I mean, we could then, as soon as we have reported these bytes, we could throw away the, this and, 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 and reuse the buffer for reading this data. That's one possibility. We could also allocate a new buffer just for getting the error context. Or we could use a pre-allocated buffer that is just there for this purpose of reporting some error context. So we have three design options if we do that. So um, let's say question three is, should the stream implementation try to get um, try to get how to do we formulate this? Try to get context data for error reports that extends beyond the currently buffered data? That's one design question. Uh, the next question is if this is yes, if this is yes, how to, how to buffer the additional context data. And we have a few options. Either we have um, use a pre-allocated dedicated um, error context buffer. Uh, B would be invalidate a stream buffer after after the buffered context data has been formatted, then read into stream buffer. I think this might get really complicated if, for example, we are parsing backwards and we want backward context. Uh, because then we probably want to format the backward context first and then only format that what we had in the buffer. So, this has a big con um, because it restricts uh, order of context formatting. So I don't think that I will do this one. Uh, the third option was, what was the third option? Allocate, allocate an error context buffer just in time. Um, I don't like this so much because I usually do not like to allocate on error because allocate on error is always asking for trouble because the error, I mean, the problem you have could be that you're running out of memory, right? And then you don't want to rely on allocations. 
also the question is yeah who owns this buffer then and who will take care to um, free it again and so on so I mean in this case maybe we could format the error message and free it again so that was that would probably not be a big problem but what is a con is here is the allocation on error which I don't like generally I always like my error reporting to work without any depending on any allocation so I'm I'm somehow tending towards 4a if the answer to 3 is yes okay so very important feature error context um, What else do we need to think about? So let's look at the data. Uh, let's look at the data stream structure again. Yeah, the next thing we need to think about is offset reporting. So we we need to know not only the context of the error, but even more important, the position of the error in the stream. And so the stream buffer needs, or the stream implementation needs to remember the location of the stream buffer. And the way I designed this so far, and I'm quite happy with it, is the stream implementation always remembers uh, it remembers the offset of this um, oh, sorry. it remembers the offset of this byte that corresponds to the first byte in the buffer this is simply this OFS value, offset value and that has the following advantage so it does not so this is not the actual current location in the stream because the current location in the stream would be uh, this one but this one can be changed at any time by the user code and so if, if the offset variable would actually store the, the, the offset of the current location it would the user code would all the time have to update this, uh, this offset variable So the way I design it is that this offset variable stores the offset of the buffer start and the buffer start is not allowed to be manipulated by the user code. And the actual current the current position is is actually offset plus pointer buffer pointer minus buffer start. This is the thing that is reported when we actually run into trouble this is called so this whole thing is called the position and there is a, a simple function for getting the position we can look at it so there's a data stream position function and it does literally this calculation and it can be inlined and it's very fast it's just not completely trivial because it does this pointer arithmetic but it's it's very fast which is important because actually there are cases we don't need the position only for error reporting uh, we also need it for some calculations that we do during parsing so sometimes we need to parse for example how many bytes to we need to calculate how many bytes we have left and for this sometimes we need the current position and therefore 
this function should be efficient and it is in this in this in this case but this function has one problem currently um, and there is also a design question related to this function uh, the problem that this currently has is that it, that it can fail as it is implemented because it gets this status parameter and the status parameter is in my code base always it, it carries the error information and whenever a function gets past the status struct it can actually fail by setting uh, by setting a failure flag in the status it, this never does but it could and so all the, all the code that is using this function must take care of this possibility. And so I actually want to remove it because getting the position in the stream is something that is so simple that I think we want to define that it can never, never fail. So this is something I want to change. I think I want to change it right now. Um, that's a design change I want to make so let's write this as, as one of the decisions oh, let's give them letters or whatever so we don't overlap so decision is data stream pos query can never fail is this reasonable how could it possibly fail? I don't see, I don't really see a way how it can possibly fail. Because if, if we had a, let's say we had at least one successful fetch. If we had one successful fetch, we have a buffer out here that has at least one byte and we know that the pointer is somewhere in the range of this buffer because otherwise the user code would have violated its contract. And we always got the byte from somewhere. We always, part of our design assumption is, is that the stream has a well-defined beginning somewhere here the stream has a well-defined beginning uh, the byte zero and if we got some byte here we assume that we have a meaningful offset from this byte zero so that this this offset and I don't see a way that this could ever go wrong if we get a success successfully get a byte out of the stream at all I mean, we can fail to get the byte, but then we fail already on the fetch. And even then we know, even if the fetch fails, uh, we know where we wanted to get the byte from, right? So, yeah, I, I think we can really say that Asking, asking for the position can never fail. There will always be some, and, and if it's just zero, I mean, if we, if we did not touch the stream at all, it's just zero. So uh, also not a problem. Yeah, so I think this decision is, is fine. And we can, we can remove we can remove this um, argument. So let's do that right now. And this clearly makes immediately clear that this function cannot fail because it does not have the status argument. So let's get rid of this. Yeah, now we cannot find the tag anymore because it includes the argument, the first one at least, probably. Um, okay, force inland we actually have here, which is, but yeah, sh we should actually move this to the header, actually. Mm. 
this is something I, I still need to take care of to clean, cleanly have my... Actually, I, I, as part of the refactor I will be doing, I want to move the, the data stream functions out of the PDF parser code and into their own uh, file probably. So I will do that later. So let's compile and get 1000 errors. Because now we need to fix this everywhere. You see that we were already using dummy things and we can really clean up the code now because we are already getting problems. Because uh, one thing that I also um, just just as I always like to avoid the allocation on error, I especially want to avoid the error on error. So if 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 I have an error in the error handling, this is a, a condition I always want to avoid. So one pro of this is avoid error on error, which we don't want to have. So so let's proceed in our quick fix. So we can get rid of the error handling here. Yeah, I should really <coughs> search for ST. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, this is actually a design question we have here. Do we want to have a function number of bytes left? Oh, number of bits left. That's the problem. Because I think we already have the function number of bytes left, actually. So where are we here in Huffman decode bitmap? This is actually something I want to refactor anyway, because this function is doing this. This was done before some new features of the data stream abstraction were added. Yeah. This is actually something Hmm The problem here is that due to some um, nasty properties of the JBIG2 standard, in our Huffman decoding, we sometimes have the problem that we, that we have to look for an end marker in the Huffman coded um, stream and the problem is that this end marker is not unambiguous because sometimes the Huffman coded data just ends 
and the next JBIG2 segment starts and the beginning of the next JBIG2 segment can look like this end marker but isn't. And the problem is if we would consume it as an end marker we would get problems parsing the rest of the, of the stream. And so I had this nasty case where I need to check do we know do we actually know how many bytes remain in the certainly Huffman coded part so that we know that whether we can safely look for this end marker in the Huffman data. And this is something I really would I really would like to move this into the data so in order to make this code cleaner here I, I do not want to parse this number of maximum bytes to read to the Huffman decode bitmap function this should be something that is handled by the data stream itself I should be able to query the data stream and say to it how many bits do you have left because that's the problem we already have implemented uh, the feature to ask it how many bytes do you have left but in the Huffman decoded data we we read code code words that are not byte aligned and so we have the problem that we want to ask exactly how many bits do we have left and that's that's more difficult so that's something to put in our to-do list for the bit sources um, provide way to query query the number of bits left in the stream screen and source um, might be unknown also that's the that's a further complication because sometimes we do not know we do not know the exact length of the Huffman data. At least it's no, there is no easy way to, to know it sometimes. Okay, so that's another, that's another problem we have. So Yeah, this is a quite complicated calculation here to, because of the possible overflow and so on. All of this needs to be cleaned or should be cleaned up by moving moving this into a nice function of the data stream subsystem. So all of these lines here should become a single function call that just asks how many bits are guaranteed to be left. So yeah, it could be something like um, data stream bit source. Ask it, we ask it for a lower bound lower bound n bits left that's what we want to know here it might be unknown then the lower bound is for example zero or it might be a very small integer um, yeah that is what we need here a lower bound yeah good that we have found this this case so let's proceed with Oh, sorry. In this, I wanted to search for this. Let's proceed with the refactoring here. And you see that sometimes it's even a advantage not to have fully automatic refactoring, because I wouldn't have found this this unclean uh, code otherwise.
actually I should I should actually look for either steam or xx then I can use m twice Okay, this is a debugging code here. We actually, I didn't have an error check. Yeah. So many places where I call this position function amazing um, yeah that's it those were the cases no not yet because we still have the tests. Okay, that was it. So let's run the tests. Let's first, this first one, this is passing. Okay, this will take some time because we are dumping all this. So actually the dumping will not be necessary in the end. It's just for debugging. So this will be faster in the end. Okay, we have a fail because I actually I activated this one, this one test that fails. It's fine. We can deactivate that again. This was the invalid file 13. But let's get back to our data structure for the data stream. Yeah, the, the length, the length member, this is, I think, I think I probably want to remove this because this is currently only used for during testing, this is the, the maximum length of the data buffer. I'm not, I'm not sure that user code needs to know this. I don't think user code needs to know this. So this is, This is probably something to remove. No, not pause length. Um, <clears throat> Does this have any downsides? Yeah, 
if we ever need to know the buffer size. This is not something we need to do all the time, so we could delegate it to a, a function a, a function uh, in the function table where we could query the stream implementation. Please tell me your buffer size if, if I need to adapt in some way to, for example, in order to optimize my read accesses, I might want to know the buffer size, something like that, that could be implemented by a function call. Would be cleaner. I think we will remove that. So, okay, this is, we already noted that this is a questionable thing. Uh, the report mode, this is just for, this is just deciding between um, text or binary reporting for error contexts or automatic detection. So I think that's harmless. The only thing here is There are also design questions regarding this. The thing is, I mean, the automatic detection works quite nicely. It works most of the time. If we only had automatic detection, things would be simplified because Okay, tests are passing, passing, so let's run the full test suite. Um, the thing is, then we could completely hide, hide this in the stream abstraction. The stream itself would just guess whether a binary or a text report would be more appropriate. The problem is sometimes the user code knows better, I guess. Sometimes the user code knows, okay, I'm definitely parsing some binary data, even if there might be lots of SC characters around. Um, so it makes sense to overrule this, but I think, I think we actually want to overrule this probably directly when we call the fail when we call the fail, right? Because currently I thought, yeah, maybe I want to set for a whole um, dynamic scope. I want to say, okay, in this dynamic scope, please do binary reporting. On the other hand, if you really want to do dynamic scope, the problem also with this variable is if you have nested substreams, this is not propagated downwards properly. So the variable is actually not a good idea. Either we want to have nothing at all, so just automatic detection, or we want to add it as a as an argument to the fail context call. So let's make some notes, questions. We are mostly coming up with questions, not answers. That's what that's how it is so far. Um, do we want to have, do we want an option to explicitly set the error context report mode. If no, then it's very simple. Then we can just get rid of this report mode. But if we answer yes, um, <clears throat> how do we want to propagate the report mode? So option A is just um, data member, as we have now data member in data stream. 
But this, I think, is a bad idea. <clears throat> I maybe should should explain this substream idea some more. Um, Although it's not not complicated, but it turns out to be quite useful. So, <clears throat> um, the idea is that you might have, for example, the whole PDF file being represented by one stream. And then you often want to work only on a subset of the stream. And even more importantly, you want to be able to switch between different sub different subsequences. So you might have, <clears throat> and I actually have already a, a real world use case for that. You might have one subsequence that is located here, for example, and, and one that is with some distance is, is, is located here. And I have such a case for JBIG2 because um, in JBIG, if you have a JBIG2 image in a PDF file, it is organized like this, that you have the so-called uh, JBIG2 globals, that is a separate substream uh, that contains the non-page associ associated uh, segments of the JBIG2 image that could be shared with other images. And then you have the actual JBIG2 page description stream that can be at a completely different uh, piece of the uh, different in a different part of the PDF file. And the thing is you often need to, or you might need to switch between reading, uh, first reading a bit here, and then reading, <clears throat> reading here, and you might want to go back and forth between them. And, but you, you do not want to, to touch other parts of the file and you do not want your um, you do not want the actual JBIG2 decoder to need to care about uh, how they are located relatively to each other or if they are even in, in two different uh, locations or actually they are in the same location and so on. So you want to abstract from that. And for this I introduced something that is the, the, con the concept of substreams. So you can uh, define these substreams and then you just pass them as abstract streams to the user code that is in this case the JVIC2 decoder. And the substreams will uh, know how to talk to the, uh, to the parent stream to get the data and they will actually reuse the stream buffer. And that's the, that's the nice part about that. So there is no copying here between the, uh, I should not have said PDF file here because the file is actually, this is actually also, this is the, the PDF stream actually, we should say so. Because the file is a, is a concept of the operating system that, that we don't really know about. And the point is that the substreams, they do not have separate buffers. They, they could have, so you could write substreams with separate buffers that also has its advantages. But actually, I wanted to have um, 
zero copy here, so so no no copying here of the data. So this is actually these are direct these directly point into the, the the buffer of the of the parent stream. They just know how to um, how to remember the position that they are at and so on. So, um, but not they do not copy data. Okay, and the initial thing that I wanted to say is. Uh, Currently, the report mode is not propagated properly from these nested streams to the parent stream. Because if we have a, an error here somewhere, so let's see, we, we, count, we encounter an error in our passing here. We, we actually tell the substream to report, but the substream delegates to the parent it will also add some context information of its own so that it says, okay, I'm in a substring that goes from here to here, for example, uh, but it will ultimately delegate uh, to the parent stream for error reporting, for getting the context and so on at the position. And the report mode is not really propagated currently. So, I think we definitely want to set the report mode with a function call. The question is, do we want to set it with the, the actual the fail context query function call, or do we have, want to have separate function calls that set the report mode? Um, that's, that's the same question. Okay, I'm back. So, um, this, we actually do not want this. This is a bad option with the data member. Uh, so we definitely, I think we, we definitely want to have a function, a uh, function call to set the report mode. Uh, here we have again sub options. Um, make report mode <coughs> a parameter of the fail context function. That is the, the actual. That is the function doing the actual reporting. Actually, I, I remember something now. Um, because currently we can only do the context reporting if we actually fail. It is always an error if you report the context. What we also want to do is sometimes you want to report stream context without failing. Because, for example, in debugging, you sometimes want to have inter intermediate reports where you look at the context where you are currently at without erroring out. And also for warnings, for example, we might want to report a warning context. This is something I, I want to add. So, um, So if we have, if we would have a dedicated function, this would have a one. This would have an advantage that we can, we could write ourselves a helper class 
a scope type of class that sets this for a dynamic context and resets it automatically afterwards, for example. So easier to set report mode for a dynamic scope. So between these two, I'm, I'm undecided currently. This makes the interface bigger. So that's the, that's a con of this one. So um, bigger interface is something that we don't like. So this is the pro of this one. It's, we already have this function. It's just adding a parameter is, is a much smaller uh, change to the interface than adding a, a complete function. Yeah, but I think we definitely do not want this one. So I think this I can already decide that I want to replace with a function interface. So we had a fail in our test, but that's actually fine. This is the micro benchmark that is currently failing because it runs out of memory. That's fine. The other ones are important. So, okay, so this, this, this stuff worked. And that's actually all the data members. So we will remove this one uh, we will also remove this one. We might remove this one, but we also might add one for the beginning of the stream. I'm not yet decided on this, but I actually like that because I, I want to have as few data members here as possible because this also will simplify the formulation of the exact contracts between the user code and the stream implementations. That's one a big to-do thing in this design review. I want to formulate clearly what are the contracts between the user code and the stream implementation. Okay, and now we, now we will actually proceed with the functions here. So fetch and fetch backwards, I already, already explained what they do. We still need to clearly formulate the, their contracts. Seek, yeah, seek is also clear. It's something we definitely need. Advance is also something that is very simple and we definitely need, uh, or yeah, we don't, we need it for efficiency. Advance is simply skip a given number of bytes from the current position. So it's a relative seek uh, and it can usually be implemented very uh, efficiently and even streams that cannot do random access can do this advance. So that's a nice thing, thing to have. <clears throat> the peak we need to talk about. This, this is a... this kind of a look ahead functionality and I'm, I'm completely un, undecided about whether to keep that. The fail context we talked about, that is very important, but this we want to somehow, we want to make this more flexible um, to get non-failing non reporting of context. And the yield, yeah, the yield has to do with the substreams. That's an interesting case. But okay, I, I need to do, I need to write down this, this peak. We need to decide about that. So 
So the idea of the yield function is the following. If you have such a, a multiple substreams, uh, as I said, I decided that they, they do not have their own stream buffers. They reuse the buffer of the parent stream. This is the, the advantage of, um, of being more efficient if you have, at least if you move a lot of data, you so you can avoid the copying of a lot of data. So um, you have, so you would have two options, uh, reuse the buffers or buffer or copy to separate buffer, buffers. <clears throat> yeah, copying to separate buffers would, would make some things more simple because then the substreams become really independent uh, from each other. Reusing the buffers uh, saves memory and this is more efficient, hopefully. But it opens up one problem if you switch between those streams. Uh, their buffer content can actually become invalidated because they are really, they so, so conceptually they are about different parts in the stream, but actually the actual implementation is that they reuse the same buffer that may only reflect one part in the stream. And so if you switch to the other buffer, uh, the, the buffer content may no longer be consistent to where the stream thinks it is. And I implemented kind of a um, cooperative multitasking uh, thing that whenever you, um, whenever you switch to using another stream, you tell this stream to yield. So you say um, your, your buffer and this stream will then um, invalidate its not its buffer because it just gives back the buffer to the parent. It will just invalidate its buffer and endpointers by setting them to zero. So then it does not have any stream buffer at all. And so you, you go to work with, with this one and then you yield this one here. And when you go back to working with this one, uh, the code will detect automatically that uh, the buffer, there is no buffer and it will initiate a fetch. And the fetch will reestablish uh, the buffer. And currently it's actually stupid. It really does a fetch on the parent, which we don't want to do but it, it will just re-establish the, the buffer pointers. And you have the same in the other direction. So here you yield this buffer and this one will then automatically fetch because it yielded before. And so uh, you have this kind of cooperative um, coexistence of, of substreams that is the reason for having this, this yield function. Whether this is a good idea overall is questionable, of course, because um, the problem is that it is not transparent to the user code. So the user code cannot treat these substreams as if they were completely independent streams. Uh, it must know when to yield because of this cooperative aspect and I did not find it to be a big hassle so far but it's definitely a questionable design aspect. The good thing is I mean we could always go back to the other decision and say okay we create substreams that do copy of the stream buffer 
or also something like do a reference counting scheme where you see, okay, as soon as there is another, another substream working on the same parent, then I start to do the copy. Something like that would be possible. And the good thing is we can implement this later without changing our whole um, interface. But we couldn't get we couldn't go back in the other direction because the other direction means adding yield calls in the user code which aren't there otherwise. So we we could also always go in the other direction to say okay we just turn the yield into a no op and we use copying streams or reference counted streams. So let's let's write this down. I think that's a good thing to have clearly formulated. So how do we want to deal with multiple substreams operating within the same parent stream? So one option is to do always copy uh, two separate stream buffers. So uh, pro is simple, con is redundant uh, copying. A B, we could have a never copy. That is what I have implemented now. Uh, and do a cooperative uh, yield in user code. Pro no copy. Con is um, requires cooperation of user code, which can of course also do forget the yield and then you might have a problem. C would be reference counting of parent stream. Yeah, then you had would have um, copy only if you have at least two streams working on the same parent, something like that. But that is, I think, quite complicated. So complicated in simple or simple for user code. Um, that's actually an interesting point to hit upon because I think there is a, a general design philosophy that is very widespread today to always, always make things as simple as possible for the user code and to accept any kind of complexity in the implementation to achieve this goal. And I'm skeptical of this general rule. So because in the end it doesn't really work because whenever you, whenever you have complexity, the complexity doesn't just disappear. It's, it's like a waterbed. If you push down the complexity in one area it goes up in another and it's you have some some degree of irreducible complexity and the problem is if you say okay i always want to have things looking very very simple to the user code you hide a lot of complexity and in the end um, you get bloated middleware that's very complicated and causes a lot of bugs and in the end the user code's life doesn't become that simple because it needs to deal with all the bloated and, and buggy middleware um, or middle layer or whatever you want to call it. And so my current uh, coding style actually moves a bit towards keeping, keeping a decent portion of the complexity in the user code. So in the, let's say, in the Uh, 
I don't know if I should call it the outermost to the innermost layer of the code. It's the um, In some way, it's the most abstract layer of the code that is farthest from details like operating system and file and so on. Yeah, and I, and I, I think you, you can have a decent amount of complexity there because it just reflects the complexity of a problem that isn't going to go away anyway. And it's good to keep also the middle layers uh, reasonable and not too complicated and not try to to baby and try to to uh, pander too much to your user code and treat it like a helpless baby because also the user code can deal with some complexity. <laughs> 